Welcome to Circular Vision. My name is Misha, and today I'm excited to be here with Professor, Professor Richoff. Professor Richoff specializes in microbiome science, chemical ecology, and environmental toxicology. He's a distinguished professor of environmental science at Duke University. So thank you so much for being here. And could you please tell us a little about yourself and what propelled you on your journey to study toxicology and chemical ecology? Oh, that's a, a long and winding path. Uh, what I really started doing was I began my research career as a cell biologist and an ecologist. So I did cell biology for fun, and I did ecology for a PhD. I worked on frogs. And um, basically, I worked on frogs because I could catch them. Mm. <laughs> um, and they were fun to catch. Nice. And there were millions of frogs around when I started my PhD. By the end of my PhD, which was in Michigan, most of the frogs were gone. Um, and what was happening at that time was acid rain was happening. This is in the early 70s. And it altered the pH of the ponds that the larvae developed in. And they didn't develop. Mm. So the frogs in Michigan crashed. And um, I was keeping track of frogs migrating. They, in the winter, they migrate into lakes and sit on the bottom in shallow water for the winter. They basically ferment for about a month because there's not enough oxygen for them in the water to breathe through their skin. And um, then as the light length lengthens, there's a huge bloom in the lakes underneath the ice, lots and lots of oxygen. And the frogs all of a sudden become active. They bleach and they crawl up under the ice and then move to swamps to breed. So I studied those frogs and their movements uh, and what happened to the uh, larval frogs when they metamorphosed and became juvenile frogs and what they did after that. So I started that. I was doing cell biology for fun. And I started working on crayfish in a little stream for fun. And everything that I could see animals doing was related to things I couldn't see was related to chemistry in some form. So as I was thinking about what I'd really like to do as I was finishing my PhD of all things, I thought, well, I really like working with molecules that make animals do things in the water. Uh, people don't know very much about that. Um, water's wet. That says biochemistry to me. And so I thought, well, what I should probably do is get a little bit of training in biochemistry, because that should be the kinds of molecules that work in water. So I went and did a postdoc at the University of California, Riverside in the desert, the high mm -hmm. desert, in biochemistry. And then as I was finishing that postdoc, I started looking for jobs. And I was trained in ecology, terrestrial ecology, working on frogs, in cell biology, and biochemistry, working on proteins and cancer, and wow. messenger RNA. And so when I applied for jobs, it never occurred to me that ecology, um, the discipline, worships predation, disturbance, and competition, and variance. And the biochemists are masters of a clear solution. There's one answer. Okay. 
And it never occurred to me that those were really opposite ways of looking at the world. Mm. And they might not get along with each other very well. Um, and that got pointed out to me. I was told I was crazy. And that um, what I wanted to do wasn't a thing. And if I'd been smart, I would have done natural products chemistry. Because that's where the rubber hit the road in chemical ecology. Mm. So eventually I got a job working on molecules that make snails, predatory snails that eat oysters, creep towards oysters. And um, that was a gold mine. I found out that I used about 4 million baby oyster drills, predatory snails in two years and did bioassay directed purifications of the odors that attracted the baby snakes come out of an egg capsule, their crawlaway larvae, they got to get their first meal. And turns out that they don't even respond to oysters when they're babies, they only respond to barnacles. Mm. And the barnacle odors they respond to aren't natural products. They're big breakdown products of proteins and they're pieces of protein called peptides. And that's biochemistry. Whoa. Whoa. And yeah. everything, every system that I looked at since Delaware, I got my job at Delaware by looking at the molecules that told hermit crabs where a new shell would be. When a big snail in the ocean eats a little snail, it's a sloppy feeder. And it releases molecules during its feeding that tell hermit crabs what species of snail is dying. And they come up and wait for the big snail to spit out the shell. Mm. And they do social interactions and stuff. Turns out those molecules were also degradation products of proteins. And they were very similar to the molecules that made oyster drills creep. Mm. Then I found out that the molecules that make oyster drills creep to find barnacles to eat them, make barnacles metamorphose. And that I could mimic all of those pheromones and cues with pure peptides, which are pieces of proteins. So I happily lived in that environment where nobody else cared for 30 plus years. Um, I became a barnacle farmer and did a tremendous amount of work for the Office of Naval Research for anti-fouling. Um, and when I started doing that, I started getting interested in how molecules worked. And the molecules and anti-fouling coatings kill things. That's how they work. The additives are designed to kill everything that comes in contact with the coating. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I didn't even realize that coatings are actually plastic. Mm -hmm. And that the toxic compounds that were in coatings were broad spectrum biosomes. So I came into, bio, into toxicology through trying to understand how standard anti-fouling management coatings worked, plus novel coatings for the Office of Naval Research. So one of the first questions I started asking was, well, how does this coating work? It's not magic, it's, it's doing something. And it turns out virtually every coating that we tested was toxic and that's how it worked. Even the non-toxic coatings contain additives that are toxic. Mm. And so that happened a long time ago. It happened in the late 90s. And I started taking PhD students before then. And then um, 
there were PhD students coming in that were interested in toxicology and the Duke toxicology program. So I joined that program, oh, about 25 years ago and have been entertaining students in toxicology since. And generally what we do is use whole animals and look at the impacts of molecules leaching from materials on development, which is really, really sensitive behavior um, and mortality. So that's been a really wonderful journey. The last 20 years I've worked uh, with material scientists and polymer chemists, engineers for the Navy on novel materials and mm -hmm. engineers have really fancy toys. Um, and so we've been able to take my barnacles that I grow and Put them in. They're the only living animals that have been in places like um, high resolution mass spect spectrometry labs, um, all sorts of fancy instruments, FTIR with germanium crystals, laser studies of water molecules at the interface between a barnacle's glue, biological glue, and a certain a surface to see how the water molecules are ordered. Micro CTs, all sorts of really cool stuff. So that's, that's what I've been doing. But through the entire time, there's this thread of biochemistry and enzymes and their products of organizing marine communities and telling animals where things are. Like if you're an oyster larvae, got to know where the reef is. So there are peptides that tell oyster larvae, drop out of the water column and land on an oyster reef. Those same molecules tell predators that eat oysters where oysters are. Um, but that puts things like barnacles and oysters, it puts you between a rock and a hard place because you can't walk. You're glued down on a surface. Mm -hmm. And sex is really important. So you either have to be parked next to another barnacle you can have sex with, or in a reef where everybody spawns at once into the water column. And the cues that tell the larvae where to settle, tell the predators where the reef is, where the barnacles are. Mm -hmm. So they actually organize marine communities and body odors on things like stone crabs and blue crabs and obigerous crabs, crabs with eggs on their bodies. Their body odors are generated by all these exogenous enzymes that are degrading the glues on their outside, keeping them clean. If you ever ask, how do you keep yourself clean or you can't scratch? Mm -hmm something like a crab with its gills on the inside where it can't get to them or its eggs on its body where it, they're glued on. But to keep them clean, you can't scratch them. All of that cleaning is done by enzymes, just like we use enzyme detergents in our, in our uh, washing machines now. Mm. So, so that's how I got involved in all of this stuff. Wow, that's very interesting, especially how uh, to think about that, I mean, you know, I'm an 18 year old finishing high school. I have not been exposed to a lot of these things. Like I have not never in depth studied pheromones besides like chemistry and biology class. You know, I only know that much about enzymes, that they're proteins and stuff like that. And, um, but just to think about that, basically a good part of our natural world is regulated by these things we do not see, do not, and most people don't even know exist pretty much. It's really interesting. Yeah, well, for, for me, one fun fact is the molecules that I work on that work in the ocean, 
have hormone representatives in your body. Mm. There are 31 families of peptide hormones in your body that are related to the molecules that I work with, with animals in the ocean, to the point where I can take something like a complement cascade protein, if you cut yourself, you activate an immune response in blood clotting. Part of that is taking little pieces of protein off molecules that are dormant to make them active. One of those pieces is something called C5A complement. I can take one end of that molecule and it makes barnacle larvae molecules. Wow. So, so I, even more interesting, the fact that you can uh, manipulate it. Yeah, and so what happens is I can use knowledge of human diseases and human functions like blood clotting and the auto in, in, in immune response. And that explains a whole lot of the biology I see in the ocean. Mm. Where so people can spend billions of dollars on blood clotting because it's really important to medicine and humans. Mm -hmm. I can use that information in understanding the processes that are going on and organizing something like an oyster reef. Yeah, chemistry is definitely a universal science. And the sad thing is it's um, because the cultures are different. The, the chemistry that I use, chemists don't teach because they keep, teach chemistry for chemistry's sake. Mm -hmm. The biochemists don't teach because they teach biochemistry for biochemistry's sake. And the, the chemistry that I do uses molecules from those systems to cause animals to behave. Which is a totally different game. So it's it's beyond, it's too much chemistry for an ecologist mm -hmm. and too much biology for a biochemist. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting crack that's basically empty because the ecologists don't understand enough biochemistry to study it. And the biochemists don't really want to go out in the field. It really makes me wonder how many more of these cracks exist of areas of study that are not as not nearly as covered as they should be. Oh, they're we barely scratched the surface. Toxicologists can't even work very effectively with mixtures yet. Mm -hmm. um, if I take a couple of disposable single-use polystyrene knives, the ones that you buy in the store for picnics. Mm -hmm. I can take three of those knives, stick them in 100 mils of water overnight. You know what a microliter is? Well, um, yeah. Yeah, but so there are oh. 1,000 microliters in a mil. Mm -hmm. I can take seven microliters, stick of that water that the knives were in, mm -hmm. they were just in it, not the knives themselves, just the water and after the knives were in it, stick it on a glass fiber filter, let it dry, and I can feed it to an anemone. And the anemone will suck on it four times as long as it sucks on a plain glass fiber filter, 20 minutes versus an hour and 20 minutes. It's got more flavor in it than you're chewing gum. Wow. So plastic tastes like food. Interesting. Animals. That's one of the reasons they eat it. Yeah. It's kind of a funny side note, but my cat would always eat plastic. I was I would always wonder what it was. Maybe it's somehow related to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I want to talk a little more about plastic. And um, so in your risk research on risks associated with plastic use, what are the most significant challenges in addressing plastic pollution from an environmental and public health perspective, in your opinion? Oh, OK. Well, so here's some things to think about. 
we're using molecules in polymers, what you can see and hold in your hand, that will last for 50 to 300 years mm -hmm. for an item that you use for 10 minutes and then throw away. At most sometimes, yeah. That's not a real good idea. That's a, a mismatch of um, the polymer and the nature of the polymer and what you do with it. So those things don't go away. So one of the biggest problems we have is plastic is everywhere now. It's not often, often it's not the polymer, the thing that the plastic is made out of that you can hold in your hand and see. It's what has been put into that polymer to make it so you can get it out of a mold, make it so you can have a sharp edge and make it so it doesn't um, change color or texture when you heat it up and then cool it back down again so you can use it. But all of those molecules aren't trapped in the, they're trapped, they're not covalently bonded. They can get out of the plastic and they leach out. And a normal plastic has somewhere between, the cleanest plastic I've seen has 51 different kinds of molecules leaching out of it. Wow. Most plastics like the ones you buy in Walmart have 150 to 250 molecules leaching out. And there are about 18,000 molecules that are put in plastics. And that's all a secret. And a whole bunch of them um, are biologically active. They're, they mimic pheromones, they mimic hormones. Mm -hmm. The pheromone mimic I can tell you about is there's a plasticizer, the, your water bottles, the clear water bottles, the ones mm -hmm. that squeak a little bit when they're empty. Yeah. The reason they don't break is they have um, plasticizers in them. The common plasticizer in plastic water bottles is a pheromone that induces settlement of sporlings of a green alga. Mm. So they settle on the plastic bottles first. And then if you're in the ocean, you go up where you want. You got a little raft. Mm -hmm. You're out there in the sun. You're a plant. Off you go around the world on a floating bottle. Yeah. The whole ecosystems have developed on plastics and they're all grafted around the world. It's absurd. <laughs> it's absurd yeah. how it seems like no one really thinks about this and whoever came up and like the industries that came up with the excessive plastic use that is going on it's well, that's, plastic's got a huge number of advantages it's lightweight it's very durable mm -hmm. easy to make it's easy to make into stuff um the oil that you make it from is subsidized so you can do it really cheaply mm -hmm. And because we don't think ahead as a society, we never consider what we're going to do with all that plastic when we're done with it. And the solution is just to throw it out. But it doesn't break down. It breaks into little pieces. It mechanically breaks down. And then you get tiny little particles that can pick up molecules, take them to you in your drinking water and your food, deliver them to you, and then on their way out of your body, if they leave your body, some of them go right into your body and go places like your brain. But the ones that come back out, before they leave, pick up molecules from you and take them somewhere else and deliver them. So they're little platforms. They're almost like a Snapchat platform. Wow. That's really interesting to think about. <laughs> no, I mean, plastics are sure are efficient 
in many ways. There's no doubting it. Sometimes I sit there and I think too because I uh, like I was sitting in Starbucks yesterday thinking about this interview and you know I look around and everyone has these Starbucks plastic cups and I was just writing questions about plastics and I'm thinking like you know can this all be really replaced with paper you know how many of the trash cans here are made out of plastics you know the um the boxes for napkins are made out of plastic my shirt's made out of plastic yeah materials are made out of plastic automobiles are made out of plastic rugs are made out of plastic we're deep into this <laughs> everywhere you look my chair is plastic yeah the phone yeah it's our houses are coated with plastic in one form or another and the, the whole like and the microplastics too like be beyond my comprehension for sure to how extensive their um presence is in our lives even from the things i know like water and food sources sometimes rain and things like that already that sounds like too much <laughs> that's just what i know but um so could you what do you think is the best way to address the issues of uh, microplastics pollution if, if there is even any well it's way more than one problem it's there isn't a best way there have to be a bunch of best ways all combined so redesigning plastics where you don't use endocrine disruptors as a common ingredient. One of the problems we have in our society is there's a disconnect between engineers and biologists. Mm. So an engineer's idea of a lot of a a molecule that's biologically active is six orders of magnitude higher than a biologist. So they might think a gram is a lot of that, mm -hmm. when in reality, it's dot zero decimal point six zeros and a one grams. Mm -hmm. or nine zeros in a one grams of material that actually impacts an animal. You can change the sex of a snail. Nanograms. Nanogram per liter of the common ingredient in polymers that's used to catalyze the reactions. Wow. And, and it's, it's there at 250 micrograms and works three orders of magnitude lower than that to change the sex of a snail. And it's, so it's things like that. The engineers don't learn biology. They don't communicate very well with biologists. Biologists don't learn engineering. They don't communicate well with engineers. So there are these silos. And between the silos is where the communication needs to be. That's why I'm willing to do things like this interview. Mm. Because your generation is going to have to fill those cracks. So do you think the combination of engineering and biology could help to solve some of these problems? If you if you add a little bit of policy, mm -hmm. economics, and a little touch of law. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a bunch of social science. then maybe you can start solving the, the, the problems. Our generation has a long way to go. <laughs> well, we left you with a mess. Yeah, and the past generation left you with a mess. Maybe. Yeah. And it's, it's just one of the reasons that plastic is such a problem. Um, you've seen pictures probably of Jakarta where there's the plastic in places is six feet deep. Yeah. Um, 
That's because that part of the world, your house was spotless. You lived in the tropics. And you threw your garbage out the door. And it was gone. It biodegraded. Mm -hmm. Now you take your plastic, your house is spotless. You throw it out in your yard and it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Not in your lifetime. So that's part of the problem is we have cultures that are used to recycling everything. And then we give them things that don't recycle. And they're essential things like water. Yeah. So it's a really complex problem. I think it's it's soluble, but right now we're doing a grand experiment that's got no control on it and that nobody designed. Mm -hmm. And we're exposing the entire world to molecules that have unknown impacts on our bodies and our ecosystems. One thing I like to say is if you wouldn't put it in your body, why would you put it in the environment? Because the environment is just one large body. It really is. I, yeah, I'm just processing that. <laughs> it seems like a lot of the things like plastics and a lot of the innovation, innovation that happens it seems that the goal is always to save time or make things easier but at the end of the day it just gives us more problems to solve <laughs> right well if you think about it most of the time there's a different goal than that the, that goal is to make money you that know, is a true you can develop a product that saves people time and effort they'll buy it Mm -hmm. And if you want to really, if your shareholders want really good return on their investment, then you have a business model that gets the consumer to take responsibility for the product you made because there's no cost of cleanup for you and your shareholders get more money. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, like six years old, virtually all the bottles were recycled and they were picked up mm -hmm. by children because you could get a nickel for a Coke bottle. You could buy a candy bar for a nickel. Basically subsidizing it. Yeah, so, so it was a circular economy then. But when plastics came along, one of the first things they switched was, well, just throw it away. You don't have to recycle it. Mm -hmm. And now look at the problem we have. And look at all the packaging. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff really isn't essential. A lot of the plastics are actually leaching compounds into our food. And we have no idea what those impacts are. We're drinking, we're breathing fibers, we're drinking fibers. We're eating microplastics. Nanoplastics go right to specific locations in your body. They can go through membranes. So it's really complex. And it's a problem that we're going to have to solve. And it's not just one answer. It's dozens and dozens of answers. And every kind of smart person in any way that you can be smart, mm -hmm. artist and a musician to engineers um, and research scientists and everyday people. They're smart in their own way. They all have to participate. And we're not ready for that. We don't even believe in climate change yet. <laughs> it's insane. And climate change is, this is a, a small part of the climate change puzzle. Yeah. 
Yeah. When I when I was little, I had this um dream of building a new city where it would be all, you know, farmland and everyone would self-sustain. But now, now I'm thinking um especially during this conversation, just the fact that there's no getting away from this. <laughs> You know, I, I, the the problem really covers the whole earth now. Yeah, it is. It's a global problem. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with my friends that I work with, mm -hmm. friends around the world, is figure out how to adapt and respond to climate change and pollution in the coastal oceans and how to make renewable energy and eventually restore the ecosystems that we're losing mm -hmm. because there's so much pollution from all sorts of sources, pharmaceuticals, plastics, um, agriculture, human waste, all going in our oceans and all destroying those ecosystems. And we need different kind of energy. We need different kinds of products. We have a lot of things that we have to change. Like I live in a little coastal community here. Mm -hmm. They're talking about replacing a park with a parking structure. And the kind of parking structure I think they should build is a five-story concrete one. Because we live on the coast and we're going to be running into Category 5 hurricanes in a little while because things are so much warmer and the atmosphere is so much juicier and things are so much more extreme. People are gonna need places to go when they can't evacuate. And that place can be a parking structure that won't blow down in a hurricane. So little adaptive things like that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Because we're gonna we're gonna have some really bad experiences as the climate continues to warm up, and it's not gonna stop. And plastics are part of that. They're making a huge amount of greenhouse gases during their generation. It's it's not all depressing. You just can't. <laughs> see. Yeah, I mean, you know. It's time to get together and start working on the problems and and actually stop pretending that we don't have problems. Yeah, no, it's um it's it's definitely it definitely gets hard to stay optimistic, but there's no point in uh complaining about these problems. No, we're one of the things that we're doing now is um everything that we do. You just you just don't get to whine. You have to propose something that could be helpful. You mm -hmm. can't just say there's a problem. You got to say what the solution might be and give some alternatives. Yeah, because that part of what happens is science builds on science, and if you start generating ideas for how you might be able to fix this problem rather than just saying, oh, this ecosystem is going to degrade. What you're calling conservation is actually monitoring decline, mm -hmm. which it was forever. Now we've got this new word called restoration ecology. Now you understand, you have to understand the system well enough to put it back. And putting it back might take 100 years because that's how long it took to screw it up. Yeah. In a good case <laughs> that everything works out. But um so do you think there's a way to I mean since it's really hard to get rid of plastics, um well you don't necessarily want to, you just need to re-engineer them so they're not as bad. Yeah, that's exactly where I was gonna go with this. Like, do you think it's possible to re-engineer plastics and implement the new plastic design into our daily lives on like mainstream uh production? I think so. I think you have to actually know about the plastics. Right now you have to do forensics because all plastic products 
are actually trade secrets. Mm -hmm. So the companies don't tell you what's in their plastic. Really? Uh, cool. Oh, it's polystyrene. Well, it's polystyrene plus um, contaminants because you made it as cheaply as possible and additives that you put in there, but you don't have to tell me about. Mm -hmm. And some of them are heavy metals, some of them are endocrine disruptors. Um, a lot of them are toxins, some are detergents. Mm -hmm. Like this, the pheromone that makes all the settle, the algae that I told about in the plastic water bottle. Yeah. That plasticizer is an environmental androgen. So it, it acts like testosterone. I heard, yeah. Yeah. And it's especially when I first moved to America when I was about nine years old, I was really surprised to see that a lot of Americans only drink from water bottles or like buy a lot of, you know, cases of water, plastic water bottles and always drink from them because I always had like a filter in my house. I would boil water and then drink it, something like that. And now finding out about like, I mean, I adapted like, I mean, I, I, I like now learning all this with like the BPAs and everything, it sounds even scarier than it was before. <laughs> well, before. Well, yeah, you're, the more, you know, the scarier it is, but you don't need to use BPA. Mm -hmm. And right now BPA free is BPS or BPH. And one of those molecules is a thousand times more estrogenic than BPA. Wow. <laughs> wow. And all of them use the same chemistry. That's why chemistry is so important, important to understand. Have you so far seen any like cases of um quote unquote like good plastic development or maybe some ideas that are still um well they're People are making biodegradable plastics. Mm -hmm. Right now, those are, I'm working on those right now. The, um, the plastic used in 3D printers and in compostable cups and knives and forks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Those plastics are interesting. They really have a lot of flavor. And then I mean, suck on them for six hours before they spit them out. Um, but a lot of the a lot of those plastics are catalyzed with an environmental estrogen, uh, organotins. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why you would compost with an endocrine disruptor and then plant vegetables in it and plan on eating them. That's just warfare. <laughs> That's just chemical <Yeah>. warfare. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that um doesn't make sense to me yet, but I'm on the edges of it. We're, we're just finding out about these things. Yeah. I mean, I imagine people who are in charge of the companies that are making these plastics often probably don't know either. Right. Well, they, how would they know? They're, they're trained in business. They're mm -hmm. trained in managing people. Um, <laughs> They're responsive to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of ethical and moral business people. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how you're doing things and whether or not it's right or wrong, what do you do? And if you've got to maximize your profit margin for your shareholders, what do you do? So that's why the problems are so complex. And we need to actually think about how to manage these issues on a much larger scale. Yeah. Rather than individual compounds and the, the way we do it right now, we need to figure out how to actually get together and identify issues and fix them. I always thought of the whole climate crisis that is going on right now including what we're talking about and climate change and things like that as um an an issue of primarily ignorance the fact that a lot of people are either unaware or you know see a little post or something like that or overhear a conversation they're like 
oh you know that's really awful <laughs> let me let me i don't know go buy a, a new car <laughs> or something and there there are lots of cultures that believe god will take care of it too they're very religious people that don't think it's in our purview and that's their view of the world and it's perfectly reasonable view of the world it's just has issues when you know that we've actually modified our climate and we can document it. Yeah. Well, it's not just natural cycles. <laughs> it's on top of natural cycles because they're real too. Human cycles. <laughs> in, in human cycles. <laughs> but yeah. Well, um, what, what else you got, Isha? I wanted to... Um, let me see. I wanted to talk about education a little bit. Do you think so? Obviously, I mean, as somebody who teaches toxicology and a lot of these uh, topics that we're talking about right now, do you think education is one of the answers to this? I think it's part of the answers, yes. But it's not necessarily the way we do it right now. Uh, I just, if there's a journal called PLOS, P L O S, sustainability. Mm -hmm. My last PhD student is trained in what we call transdisciplinary education for a PhD. So she's trained in toxicology, um, ICPMS uh, policy. Mm -hmm. um, she understands enough to talk about law. She's worked for the World Bank. She's worked on the Hill. All of these different things. Her committee was made up of me, a card-carrying fish toxicologist, um, a person that does policy for the Nicholas Institute, which is a kind of a think tank, mm -hmm. and a lawyer. Mm. And that was a toxicology program, PhD. And so that's a new kind of education. That's one that doesn't normally fit in academia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard if you're an academic, you grew up in a silo and you understand your silo and you understand its boundaries. And you don't cross those boundaries because they're out of your field. Um, younger people are coming up that aren't necessarily in those silos. Like all the people I talk about, I'm, I, I'm probably the, the one that started this, this particular journey because I'm the oldest and I'm not really a scholar. I already, you saw from my background that I did a bunch of different things that never occurred to me, didn't go together, like biochemistry and ecology, mm -hmm. policy and biochemistry, toxicology, and polymer science, mm -hmm. things that don't normally get matched up like that. That's the future. The future is working in large groups, being able to communicate across those groups, and being able to work in concert with your own perspective to deal with a problem that's much larger than your one discipline can handle. And that's climate change and that's plastics. Yeah, it's a definitely a collaborative effort. Like yeah, technically everyone needs to participate for it to perfectly work out, which is obviously hard to organize, although not impossible. <laughs> Especially when uh, at least a third of the people don't see a problem. Don't see a problem and they make it about politics or about some kind of tribalist idea of, oh, you know, this is some liberal stuff or this is some Republican stuff. You know, it it almost sounds funny to think about it like that. <laughs> yeah, but. well, eventually... One of the things that happens eventually is people have to pay attention to the real problems. Mm -hmm. The only issue with that is when people finally start paying attention. It might be hard um, to do something about you've it. You've got a, a huge lag 
just think day length and when winter actually comes, like the shortest day was in December. And now we have winter as the day length is increasing. We have the same problem with climate change. We're going to start solving climate change and it's going to be decades before we see any effect. Mm -hmm. It's going to be real slow. There's a lag. Yeah. And adapting while you're waiting is a really good idea. And figuring out what to do now to at least save part of what you used to have for the future and how to do that effectively. And then realize that you have to modify your environment if you're gonna keep this many people on the planet to make more energy. And somehow you have to reconcile that and that's almost like ocean zoning. Mm. If you think about it, how do you do that? Where do you set these things up? Because mm -hmm. the coastal oceans are where everything is closed and where you can actually change things. Yeah. And I mean, despite that, it seems it, there needs to be a lot of research done and a lot of activity in this area. I mean, there's still a lot of different things our society seems to be focused on, things like AI development and space exploration, things like that. Specifically on AI research, and um, do you oh. think do you think it's could be um, will have an impact on how we address climate change? And uh, no, I think and if you look at the consequences of space exploration, mm -hmm. phones. Our communication right now, mm -hmm. self-driving cars, solar stuff, mm -hmm. that's all part of what it took to put people in orbit. Mm -hmm. Everything that, that's happening right now is related to investments that we make in trying to figure out how to do new things. But somebody's got to start playing cleanup. Because mm -hmm. there are just too many people and there's too much stuff being left behind. You can see it in Florida, depending on where you live. I know I drove down a couple of those freeways and I could see those giant mountains now. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I live right nearby there. I've been there. <laughs> it's fascinating to me yeah yeah i went to the recycling facilities to like see like how it operates and stuff and the stuff that even makes there most of it doesn't get recycled it's really interesting yeah well no that's and you have to figure out ways to get that done mm -hmm. okay so education is important it's not the do all and end all because Applied education is what we need. Yeah. And actual problem solving that helps society is what we need. In mm -hmm. addition to advancing basic knowledge, so you get things like computer chips and um, cameras mm -hmm. and ways to communicate. AI yeah. can be very valuable eventually. It'll be misused at the same time, but so is everything but yeah so is everything so it's all a balance um any other questions um so i would just like to sum up a little bit because uh, it's definitely covered a lot a lot of really interesting concepts so uh, i personally wrote down the idea of engineer biologist combination which i mm -hmm. thought was really interesting and uh it's definitely a really tangible and doable step to uh, make some kind of progress further and um, education obviously and um things like that but how would you say is there anything else you could you would say that gen z and uh you know anyone coming in the future could do to uh, address 
uh, the issues of uh, the climate crisis. Being aware is really key. Mm. And being engaged is really key. And a lot of that is really hard when you're young because you don't, you're, you're still just learning these experiences. You're trying to stay alive. <laughs> you're, you're trying to navigate. You don't have control of a lot of things and you don't, you know stuff, but you don't necessarily understand all of it. I know stuff, but I don't understand all of it. It takes me decades to actually understand something that I've known for 20, 30 years. And I didn't understand it until maybe I get lucky enough to give it again in a lecture and like a little light goes on. Mm. And then I understand it. And that's a different game because once you understand it, you can use it. Until you understand it's really hard to use it. Mm -hmm. And realize that questions I asked when I was a little older than you are, took 40 years for me to answer. Mm -hmm. So there's also a really long process in solving issues and you can't do it fast. Mm -hmm. Really complex problems take a long time to solve because they're difficult and they're multifaceted. So people that are willing to dedicate a chunk of their lives to figuring something out is really key. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to like something and you do it long enough, you're going to be good at it. And that's also something that will take me years to understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you're plenty smart. Thank you. And you're the future. That's why I'm willing to talk with you because the future is important to me. Thank you very much. And I really enjoyed the interview. Um, I don't want the other interviews to ever hear this one, but like this is probably one of my favorites because I, I could really, um, like it's a lot of the things I've been thinking about somehow got brought up and uh, touched upon. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for taking your time, too. Um, really, really appreciate it. And you can always drop me lines as you progress and let me know what's happening in your life and new insights, because I'm going to go home and cook dinner for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, go cook dinner for myself. Thank okay. You. you have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.